everyone again welcome to the winter's hall show just give me a few seconds my guest for the evening um miss sherry gay what are you doing that dag no go she must have had a cross and communication not really sure i hope she's okay but i haven't heard from her i heard from her earlier today just to confirm, but then she didn't check in. So Sherry, if you're out there, I'm hoping everything is okay. We will reschedule because I really wanted to talk about everything that's going on with you in the redistricting and also the Detroit public schools, but the show must go on. So I'm on here um, to talk just for a few minutes about some breaking news. We did receive some breaking news. So let me go ahead and share but i'm so sorry everybody i really want to talk to miss sherry tonight but we will get our chance again soon but um i guess we're gonna do like a we can do a part two we can call this the evening bump we're gonna do the evening bump mickey we can do the evening bump yeah this the winter's hall show slash the evening bump so go ahead and share out Everybody get a chance that didn't get a chance to talk to us and listen to us this morning. We back on here tonight. So tell a friend to tell a friend that went to see Mickey. We back double dose today. So let me share and shouts out to A10 News Media Group and the greatest producer in the world, old Spacely Sprocket over there. We got to get him a shirt to say Spacely Sprocket with a, with a rocket ship. <laughs> Because he, he ain't been jumping off the plane with me lately. So I'm proud of him for that. I got a call that said, they coming for her, but you know they coming for you too. I said, damn, there ain't no way I can back out of this. You, you would have left me? Uh, you would have left yeah, me on the plane by myself? Yeah, because they said you've been, you been, you been pissing off a lot. I don't think people. I've been pissing off anybody. I think I've been really good. Don't y'all think so? Y'all go ahead and share that your word is no good. I'm not listening to you and your word in the street because your your word means nothing. (laughs) One one second, everyone. Give me about two more minutes and we will go ahead and get started. You should, you can say hello to everybody like you do in the morning. Say hello to them in the in the evening. People want to see, they want to be greeted in the evening too, sir. Oh Lord, it didn't take much to make you mad, did it? I don't want to talk, man. You know, I can do this to them. All the time. Every time. All the time. We'll be on a good thing, and then you just just go off to the left. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait a minute. She said she's on. <laughs> my guest is on. Listen, she oh, overslept. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, what a great surprise. Yeah, we we going to bring her in. in <laughs> we going to bring her in. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. How are you doing, beautiful? Honey. <laughs> Listen, I understand we are live already. I said <laughs> You have no idea. Yes, I do, because I've been watching you all day run from here to there to here to there to back to everywhere. So I know you are a busy woman. Busy and exhausted. Oh. But you give your word, you try to. You try to do what you say you're gonna do, but uh, yes, yes, I'm one. I'm one person. I understand. And I'm wore out. <laughs> I understand. I was just explaining to everybody. I'm like, I wanted to talk to Miss Sherry. Please pronounce your last name for me because I've been butchering it all week. Gay Danielle Go. Da- gay Danielle. Gay. Yeah, gay. If you think gay and then you say Dan and yogurt. Okay, Danielle Go. Mm-hmm. I got it. So let me let you get yourself together and everybody get themselves together while I'll share this out. It's a video that I want Mickey to play. You're already familiar with, but um, Mickey, can you cue up that video? Um, bring it to the stage because we're going to, this is what we're going to be talking about. 
were drawn after the 2020 census continues, even as there was another court hearing scheduled for this afternoon. To try to put some clarity on this murky subject, political reporter Rick Albany here now to tell us what the courts have ruled is wrong with those districts, what's at stake, and what happens next. Sue and Brian, let's take those in order. First, what's wrong with the way those 13 districts are drawn? The panel of three judges concluded that the districts did not offer an opportunity for minority voters to have representation. By drawing districts that heavily divided those minority urban areas and combining them with more suburban districts, those minority voters and candidates were not afforded equal protections as provided under the law, according to the court. So what's at stake? First and foremost, the rights of voters in the Detroit area to have those equal protections. But it doesn't stop there. Since all districts have to be roughly the same size by population, redrawing the seven House and six Senate seats and keeping exactly the same numbers and just rearranging the district lines and still produce an outcome that the courts will accept seems highly unlikely. In other words, it would take a miracle to keep other districts from being redrawn. How many? Well, in the last two weeks, I've seen all types of estimates, but I remain unconvinced that only the 13 challenge districts will have to be changed. So in addition to the voting rights of thousands of voters, the balance of power in the state legislature could be at stake. With Democrats holding a slim two-vote lead in the Senate and all six of the Senate districts in question currently held by Democrats, a loss of one would mean a 1919 tie in the upper chamber. The lieutenant governor, as president of the Senate, could break a tie, so if all Democrats stay on board, they could theoretically continue to move their agenda. If two seats flip, Lansing could grind to a halt. Same in the House. All seven seats being challenged are held by Democrats. If upcoming special elections return a majority for Democrats, as expected, only one loss would bring gridlock to the House. It really does matter. What happens next? Redistricting commissioners voted yesterday to appeal the judge's ruling. And today, they asked that same panel of judges to put a stay or a hold on the ruling until they can appeal. A plaintiff in the lawsuit and former Democratic State Representative Sherry Gay Dagnogo said in a release speaking of the commission and the appeal, quote, the people in the city of Detroit and Michigan should be appalled that they, meaning the commission, have already wasted $5 million of taxpayer money and at the cost of a Supreme Court appeal, could easily double that amount. When I asked a spokesperson for the redistricting committee about costs associated with the appeal, Edward Wood sent this reply, quote, our attorneys bill by the hour and invoice monthly, so I will not know how many hours that decision will cost the commission until mid-February. According to Michigan's constitution, quoting here, the legislature shall provide adequate funding to allow the commission to defend any action regarding an adopted plan, MAP. Consequently, and if necessary, this remains an option available to the commission. That word shall in the constitutional amendment leaves the legislature very little wiggle room. So now we wait for the courts to decide the next move, but with a presidential primary in a month and a half, Deadlines for filing for the 2024 state primary roughly 60 days later. There's an urgency to get this matter resolved. And if new districts have to be drawn, get that done too. As I pointed out earlier, it's not guaranteed, but seems likely that more than just those 13 districts will be impacted. And that could mean a lot of political calculating for sitting members and would-be candidates. All right. We are back. So I gave you a few minutes to get yourself together, beautiful. <laughs> Honey. <laughs> you can definitely, you can definitely be Beyonce and say, I woke up like this because you are beautiful. You are radiating, darling. I, I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I, I gotta look at you this way because we haven't moved the TV yet, but just notice I just know I'm looking at you and I appreciate oh, you no, so that's much. Fine. You're fine. You're fine. I, okay. I'm just listen. And my niece, she probably the one who jinxed me. I can't wait to tell her. She's like, set your alarm. I said, I did. She said, because I don't want you to oversleep. I said, I'm not. <laughs> That's okay. Wait till I tell her this. 
I was sitting there and I said, okay, I'm just, I got to go on. And, and my girlfriend from DC that's watching, she was like, you, you, you still got to go on. I said, you right. The show must go on. So I said, I'm just going to wait and start at six. And while I was telling everybody, you know, it must've been some lines cross communication, something had to come up, but I was like, Miss mm -hmm. Sherry, if you out there, just know, I hope you okay. And you at home sleep, but that's okay. You need to yes, I was been not, busy, baby, busy, busy. out. <laughs> well, I'm good. Well, that's okay. Well, you up now, and I want to welcome you to the Winters Hall Show and the ATN News Media Group Network with all of our family. Listen, I've been, um, I know that you are big and you are really into what's going on, the redistricting, redistricting of uh, former state representative. You now serve on the Detroit Public School Board. I've done some research and uh, 1719, 1792, uh, when our first census was, was drawn. And I was watching a commercial and it said that every 10 years, voters should not pick the politicians. The voters should pick the politicians, not the other way around. Right. And it seems like that's what's happening when they try to do this redistricting map. And so every 10 years, the district maps are redrawn based on the census data, and that's called redistricting. Uh -huh. And so um, it goes on to say, well, well, who who's affected most by this? And it's our black and brown communities, our our uh, low income, poverty stricken communities uh -huh. and our young people. Right. And just here in Flint, just giving a little background in Flint before I let you take the floor and introduce yourself and tell us all about this. Our wards were cut in half here in Flint, like, like right through a park. Uh -huh. I mean, they had lines drawn all over the place. Um, also, I was watching something else where it said that the redistricting commission in Detroit, they met and they were supposed to have a vote about something. I want you to explain that too. And then they could get a quorum back. Did you hear about that? Like about three months ago? They was yeah. Yeah. Commissioners left. Uh, some left out. Um, they were actually it was with them filing for a lawsuit. Part of okay. That, but that was for the commission. Okay. And so um, we've been doing recalls here in Flint for some of our city council members. And, and what's been going on with that is that if you stayed in the sixth ward at that time, you have been moved to the second ward. They have sent out the city clerk's office, has sent out new voter registration cards, which still say that you are in the new second ward. But they're uh -huh. saying if you go to the polls to vote, that the poll watchers will be able to decipher which ward that you are in. And if you are voting in the recall, you can only vote in the recall if you were in the old map and not oh, the new uh. map. And the new map doesn't go into effect until 2026. Jerry, what the hell is going on with this redistricting in Michigan? Yeah. So when it comes to the census and, and the, the redistricting and reapportionment is is the word also interchanged with. And I talked to our students about this today at two schools. Um, that's based on the population. And oftentimes, uh, especially in urban communities where people have been adversely impacted, there's always been this lack of trust. Uh, and in some instances, apathy, where people just don't complete the census. So um, we know in 2010, 2020, and, and then again in 2030, that is what actually takes place. Uh, we know that the numbers have been disputed in the city of Detroit, but I'm sure um, there are instances in which there are challenges for those who are uh, displaced, homeless, and otherwise who perhaps did not complete the census as well. So, but that's what the numbers, the redrawing and the redistricting is based on. Mm. Uh, here in Michigan, 2018, um, a referendum was put on the ballot um, that you kind of referenced, uh, an initiative called Voters Not Politicians. And with that, um, a group of, of individuals with an interest um, and a lot of money came together to put this on the ballot. Putting a referendum on the ballot requires hundreds of thousand dollars, if not in some instance, million, um, to actually get the number of signatures that are necessary 
and to actually um, do the, the language properly. And, and in doing so, uh, it was passed and marketed um, to have this commission created with 13 commissioners who basically the mindset at that time, it sound good that the voters should be picking the politicians, not the politicians picking the voters. Nice tagline, but right. what, you, what you end up having is 13 uh, novice commissioners who are not, who have not drawn maps before, mm -hmm. um, have to listen to an expert. Uh, and in this instance, it was an attorney called um, Bruce Adelson, um, who, if you recall back some months ago, <clears throat> um, resigned abruptly once it was found that um, he intentionally misled the commissioners to reduce the voting age population. You'll hear that term called BVAP. You may okay. see it as B V A P, but um, but that means is there's a certain percentage of black voting age population in a given area. And so like Flint, like Detroit, like Benson Harbor, Benton Harbor, like Inkster, uh, like Highland Park, a number of places where you have high concentrations of African Americans, we know in in most instances, these are democratic seats. Mm -hmm. Because the voting age population or black voting age population is significantly high. And under the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, uh, it is clear that that guideline was put into statute, into law, to prevent the reduction of black voting age population in given urban areas uh, to be reduced to a point where what you've seen in Senate District 8 with former uh, Senator Marshall Bullock uh, represented that area. It was reduced so significantly that um, the suburban counterpart who now had 75% of his previous district um, or the new district, I should say, um, for Senate District 8, and he only had 25%, or approximately, these are approximates. Mm -hmm. um, and the Black voting age population was reduced. So you have 25% Black people, Detroit, um, who were outnumbered by 75% of people who are now across 8 Mile and predominantly... Um, Oakland County and other places, uh, and a bit, bit piece of Macomb as well, who now vote two to three times that of the people on the Detroit side, but also outnumber oh. the people on the Detroit side three to one. So if you a, a person competing or the former senator competing and anyone else competing in that seat would never be able to win that seat because the black voting age population was intentionally, that's the part people need to understand, intentionally, intentionally reduced so low that nobody could compete at scale um, uh, because, because it was reduced so low. To add insult to injury, so it's like two factors at this point against them. The, the percentage of Black people in that given district and the voting differential. Again, voting three to one is three to one in a space that is three to one, uh, you know, do the math. And, th right. and then the last thing I'd say is now you're asking a Black candidate who had, had not represented or don't even have a base in an Oakland or a Macomb area to be able to survive and campaign and raise money. That's the part. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and if you've if you've ever campaigned in an area that is predominantly white, going to knock on doors, especially a black man, what that experience would be like <laughs> or was like. Right. We've had state reps to be detained um 
by police officers because they were black men oh, walking wow. in areas and that, that were predominantly white. So if you think about all of those dynamics, mm-hmm. it, it made it absolutely impossible um, for any for any African American to to win that seat because the odds were literally stacked against them on purpose. So that mm. that's that's just one example of the seats. Now, um, having the the six the, having the, the seats in the in the house, the six Senate seats, the six House seats, and seven Senate seats, or vice versa. I've got my numbers mixed up right now. Uh, those are not the only seats that were challenged and that we believe met that same criteria of Black voting age population reduction. Uh, it's just what the courts allowed for. It's what okay. the courts allowed for. So it was proven unanimously, voted on unanimously by all three judges in that panel that the commission had in fact used racial gerrymandering. Uh, that's another word that comes up when I find when I when you look up redistricting, you see gerrymandering not too far behind it. Mm-hmm. So I know you um are you talking about the court cases because I, I remember you telling me, you know, because we had to push it back out a week and you said we're going to we're going back to court at the end of March. Mm-hmm. So are you now about to explain to us like what happened, like what came right. out of all of that? So, okay. Yeah. So so just recently, you know, I mean, we've gone through a lot. You've mentioned, you know, they didn't have a quorum. Um, you had three members. Uh, Chair Zatella, um, Commissioner Lang, um, uh, and there's one more. I always forget the third person. <laughs> but there are like three three uh, commissioners that really have tried to stick to their guns on being fair. Um, there are four that came to court and actually testified in our favor um, that basically share like, wow, we had no idea. We were told we were in many of their meetings were closed door sessions. I'm sure you saw some of that. There was a lack of transparency. Um, you got these 13 people who sign up supposedly um, uh, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. It was supposed to be a bipartisan effort, uh, but they but they were put in these rooms. They were told to sign non disclosure agreements. Okay. Uh, and were led astray. And I have to say, while maybe those who put the referendum on the ballot weren't malicious or, or ill-intended, certainly the outcome is that you can't expect a commission of complete novices to be able to draw maps that would be that would fairly align with the Voting Rights Act uh, and the protections therein to do that, and and have one person, well, actually two, uh, mm-hmm. their their attorney Pastula and Bruce Adelson, who were basically, you took the power away from those in the legislature, but you gave it to one, maybe two individuals who led the thirteen commissioners astray. What and balloons keep coming from in your background? <laughs> Some no, that's somebody is. Somebody's pressing love or something. I don't oh, know. okay. I don't okay. have no balloons. I keep seeing them come up. I'm like, that's cute, but okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's somebody pressing love or something. I don't know. I can't see that well because I'm 57. Oh, <laughs> girl, you don't don't say that. You don't look. <laughs> we don't say our age, baby. We just look good. <laughs> I, I, girl, I love my age. A lot of people don't say their age, but I love my age. Well, you look But yeah, wonderful. I mean, just when you think about this whole case, though, you know, it's textbook disrespect to Black folks. I, uh, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but let me answer this question real quick. Uh, ask you this question because okay. the they, they scroll in like the end of credits in the movie. Uh, is this court case only for Detroit districts or all districts in Michigan? That's coming from one of our viewers. So it's only Detroit at this juncture because that was the only um, plaintiff. The, the case was driven by plaintiffs that signed up to be willing to stand up and fight back. Okay. Um, and so 
I will say this, um, Flint being in the situation that it is, like you said, split into two, you know, if said persons um, <laughs> were willing now to come forward with, with a lawsuit, um, I think the precedence has been set that it was proven that the commission did draw seats based on racial gerrymandering and other areas and groups, you know, uh, I believe it, it would make their effort a lot easier than ours was initially. This has been like a two year process um, and many mm -hmm. people wouldn't get involved. Um, uh, some people, I guess, lack the information of what was actually happening. Um, and it, it was hard work. There's not, you know, there's no funding source that is available to, you know, make the state aware. And on the backdrop, the benefactors of this are Democrats. Mm -hmm. And now I would say the majority of them white Democrats, <laughs> okay. but the, the benefactors are Democrats. And so many people did not want this case to move forward. Um, although there was a reduction in black representation, 20% a reduction statewide of black representation. Wow. Wow. So yeah. yeah, like, like I was explaining to you earlier, they redid all of our ward maps. Um, I've never seen anything like it before. Um, they have been redoing this for years, but it just seems about just the way that they redrew, they, you know, redrew the maps this year. It's causing such a stink. And, and, I, and so I wanna, obvious. I, if I, I want to say I want to say this too because because we use this term so loosely with respect to redistricting um, that this is done at the federal level, which is okay. what we've challenged because it includes the House, the Senate, our congressional maps as well. Um, but in our local municipalities, you have commissions, county commissions, and you have city councils. Um, as well, that did their reapportionment, their redistricting. So mm -hmm. sometimes people hear it and they just kind of move all the seats interchangeably, whereas our lawsuit is dealing with House, Senate, Congressional versus okay. your your wards and your um, county commission. Uh, if if you guys uh, county commission, I believe may have done that as well unless unless i don't know yes. i'm not sure which county which county are you guys are you ingham who's ingham what, what county are you guys genesee county genesee that's right genesee mm -hmm. county that's what i'm so yeah genesee county so i haven't paid much attention to your the commission work there but our wayne county commission did their maps with little to no uh fanfare a lot of people didn't even really completely know it existed it happened. There was no there was no outside commission making decisions for them. The commissioners themselves with their council did their reapportionment. Uh, same thing here in the city of Detroit. The city of Detroit, you guys call them wards. They call them districts. Um, but they did theirs with pretty little to to know. You know, there were some meetings. There were community people who weighed in and what they wanted to see. But it wasn't a whole lot of issue. The issue came into play when this commission now voted on statewide had the authority to reapportion the districts at the ex uh, at, uh, at the expense of many black voters, but but also uh, exclusion at the exclusion of the legislature. Previously, the legislature did their own process. Okay, and at that time, I would say the last time. Uh, 2010, Black Senate and House members worked with members on the other side of the aisle to make sure that they stayed in compliance with the Voting Rights Act. Okay, okay. Now, the way they put it off on us with our wards, because I'm, I'm talking locally right now, is that they were making all of the wards even, like an even voter base in each ward. That's how it, they they tried to sell it to us, and but I don't think that's be. the case. Yeah, but that's that's what it should be to a degree. If you look at the software that they use to draw the maps, like every house member is supposed to have approximately ninety to a hundred thousand voters, mm -hmm. 
you know, so so that's House members. I don't know what the population calls for with respect to your wards and how evenly dispersed the population is. That is how. But anytime you have um, people who have an agenda, in a lot of instances, people do have a political agenda. Um, and sometimes that negatively impacts the direction of things. Absolutely. Uh, and so the citizen's voice might be missing from the process. Mm -hmm. They might unfairly, um, without transparency, show various um, iterations of what the maps could look like or take commentary from the community. If, if, if very wealthy people or those who have some interest decide they want to weigh in, Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it it always happens at the expense of our community because Absolutely. our community don't have this free time to go to every meeting mm -hmm. um, and or the finances to be able to influence the outcome. And we know yeah. that money talks. Right. And shout out to former um, uh, state rep, Cynthia A. Johnson, who's joining us tonight as well. She said Detroit is the only one predominantly black city. Is only one predominantly black city. Why were other cities excluded if this is about making things right? They weren't excluded. They, they weren't excluded. Again, the process, in order to have a lawsuit, you have to have plaintiffs. Okay. And you have to, you know, plaintiffs have to step forward um, to make a claim to say, I was not, I was hurt by this. And, and that's the work that had to be done, you know, as a plaintiff agent, um, you know, having my boots on the ground, I've heard from people their displeasure. And then I, I followed it up and say, okay, well, would you like to be a part of this effort? Um, in order to do that statewide, it would have taken a budget and money that nobody was willing to, to put forward mm -hmm. um, to make that a reality. So it's, you don't always get justice uh, unless unless you have people who are willing to finance justice. It that's costs true. money. It costs money to file a lawsuit. And that's it what she money said. Money, 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 money. Right. To educate people. Like, I mean, like a lot of people don't. You saw we saw each other in Benton Harbor mm -hmm. um, this last weekend or week before last weekend before last. I was in Flint. I mean, I don't represent these those areas and I they can't vote for me. I'm not running for anything statewide. I haven't ran for anything statewide. So why am I going to other black communities? I go because I care. Um, I go because what happens to black Flint, uh, what happens to, and, you know, I mean, I, and I don't want people to feel like, oh, she's just about black. But I mean, it's like we have to come together and support each other because oftentimes, regardless to who's in office, we're the one who are adversely impacted because we're left out or taken for granted. And that's what we saw in this process. Democrats benefited from a majority that was at the expense of black leadership. And they weren't mm -hmm. willing to speak up and say anything because all they cared about was the majority. Mm -hmm. Another question from one of our viewers that says, can you ask her, what can we do to help put pressure on this situation? Well, when they say pressure, I mean, is there a convener, an organizer, a person that says, you know what, we were hurt by this too. We, our city was split. Um, you know, we want to be a part of a claim or an effort. If there are people who are willing to do that and to fund it, precedence has been set. Once you have one victory, we have, we have set the foundation now for others to come behind and enjoying with a similar lawsuit and say, hey, we we were impacted by this as well at the state level, at the uh, Senate level, and and then at the congressional level. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we have to look at. And you know, while your population is smaller, and I and I'm no data expert on all things Genesee County, right. if you have people that will look into that and be willing to to fight for that, then you can move forward. Um, I have to say, I believe I believe that uh, that uh, Sheriff Sheriff Chris Swanson. Thank you. <laughs> um, has certainly, you know, 
contacted me directly and, and let me know that this is something that he strongly um, believes in. And, you know, if there's anything that he could do to be helpful to let him know, hey, maybe some of these people need to reach out to uh, Sheriff Swanson and say, hey, we, we believe that Genesee County needs to be looked at and see how you can build a coalition of people that can come together that are willing to fight back. Mm, okay. So where are you guys at right now with the house? So what, what, what projection? Where we, are, where we are right now is the seats have been finalized for the house side. We were able to improve. Originally, if you look at the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistrict Commission website, it's the maps were selected under the name of Hickory. The Hickory maps were the ones that were selected. And um, going forward in this process, we were able to uh, improve the outcome. Uh, there was the ability to get 10 seats. Uh, we believe that there was a, a, certainly an opportunity for nine, which is a map that the Michigan Democratic Party Black Caucus, uh, improvements of the Motown that they pushed forward. Uh, we were not able to land there. Uh, I think there was a compromise and the commission's Motown map was ultimately accepted by the courts and, and finalized um, at the end of March. So now we're on to the next process of redrawing the Senate seats. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I do want to touch on one more thing. Um, sure. the, uh, the Detroit School Board. Mm -hmm. What is it looking like down there? We are having some issues here with our school board. It seems like the state is setting the foundation for us to fall, <laughs> fail, fail and fall. I, I can say both of those words. Um, we were not in the budget to get saved out of from our debt. Um, the population is shrinking. People are taking their children out and putting them in other school districts. And, you know, for that famous count day, the other districts are welcoming our children. Uh oh, she exited. She'll be back in soon. Mickey, what happened? <laughs> She'll come back. There she go. Now you got to bring her back up. I'm here. Okay. I'm still here. I didn't know what okay. happened. Okay. Okay. So some of our, um, so like uh, Deborah said, the entire goal is to privatize public education. Uh -huh. Do you feel like they're trying to do that in Detroit as well? Because yeah, there, there has been an ongoing effort, even during my tenure in the house, even before my tenure in the house, um, black communities, which have been charterized uh, at enormous scale, and you won't find that same level of charterization in white communities. Um, and it's it's been an agenda by very wealthy people to do that. I know that we do have some black people who have opened their own charters, um, and if they serve a unique purpose, um, I you know I get it. Um, but in many instances, it is not a unique purpose. Um, it's just you know really cash cows that people have been able to get very wealthy um, from having these schools, and that was the the start to me. Of, of the crumbling of, of public education. Um, many of these schools were supposed to be designed to be an alternative choice to improve quality. But as you know, based on state, state scores, a lot of instances, they are not um, passing muster with respect to improvement. Um, it's just, you know, another system whereby people have been able to surpass um, public oversight. And what I mean by that, many of these charter schools don't have elected school boards. And as such, board members, you know, those that have been authorized by various universities and so on, the, the board selected um, echo the sentiments of those who run the school and um, they don't oftentimes yield themselves or veil themselves to the population that is attending their schools. So many boards can be miles and miles away from residents, but yet mm -hmm. our community fall prey easily thinking that they're getting something better 
and sign their children up for some of these failed experiments because that's all they are. Um, again, and not answering to the citizens. And that and that's problematic. And so then once you start getting a bifurcated system, a system that's been splintered and split, that, that starts eroding the funding. You you split up the student population, you erode the funding, and then you start blaming the districts for poor performance mm. um, and not providing adequate funding is another issue uh, when you have districts who are in more affluent communities based on proposal A, Prop A, um, you know, I explained to my students today that you can have families living in suburban areas with million dollar homes and a percentage of their funding going into the schools, uh, whereas in urban communities, homes that are less um, affluent and then that money, if you look at the difference, just like I talked about voting differentials, now you have finance differentials. And so a house that is $50,000 house or a $100,000 house versus a, a district who has a million dollar house or a million dollar houses funding the schools, you could get a student who's getting per pupil allocation for under $9,000 in Detroit and or in Flint and then districts like West Bloomfield and Troy and so on uh, in Oakland County that are getting $15,000 a student. Wow. So you have these, these savage inequalities and until we create a fair funding model um, statewide that doesn't just rely on property values, then we're gonna have these this gaping hole in what urban communities get versus um, what suburban communities get. And so you have people that are not always astute also in the legislature on education. I mean, before we got a majority, a number of things happened under um, Republican leadership. And it, it was amazing to look at the, the education pedagogy of some of these people that didn't even have an associate's degree making laws about education. Uh, and so all of those things come into play. People who are not familiar with or astute on the challenges that exist in, in, in urban communities can oftentimes make laws that penalize poverty. And, yeah. and that's what we see happening. People that don't understand why, you know, a third generation of children who might be raised by grandparents might struggle uh, with their schoolwork and or or sometimes getting to school, kids that of homes where one or more parent has been incarcerated, um, uh, kids that are coming from homes that are nutritionally deprived. I mean, I could name a myriad of issues. And for the same reasons that COVID uh, grossly impacted urban uh, Michigan, uh, more significantly than it did suburban, it's it's a sign of a sickness. It's a sign of poverty. It's a sign of a uh, lack of access to quality education, quality water, quality environment. Um, I, I did a video, I, I was at a school today mm -hmm. and I left and listened to the live video when I left. And what I heard on the backdrop really kind of made me sad. You could hear me talking to the students and you could hear the students talking to me. But in the backdrop, playing for quite a while during that video, I need to measure the time, it was sirens. Mm. Think about the psyche of children who are going to school in more affluent communities where all you hear is flora and fauna and deer and the ripple of leaves yes. um, blowing in the wind versus kids in more affluent communities. On this video, all I heard was this siren, because I was wondering when I was in my car, was it a siren following me? I kept looking back to see if, if, if there was a fire truck or something coming. And then I realized it's in the, the audio from the, the live video that I taped at the school. And so people don't, we, we, we're busy in life. We don't take the time to simply think about all of the adverse issues that we are subjected to. Um, I was sitting down talking to a police officer who had moved 
out of the city of Detroit and just thinking about all the years and his stress level of working downtown Detroit and then, um, you know, hearing gunshots or car accidents or sirens. And then they moved um, to a suburban neighborhood. They're like, when, when I get to my neighborhood now, I don't hear all of that and my stress level goes down. That's mm -hmm. kind of sad it because is. we internalize this. We we live like every day, like it's just, you know, we're, we're so, it's, it's like you're exposed to the stinking house so much that you don't even know it's stink. That's right. That's and right. That's, and psychologically, that's what our kids are subjected to. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, and that's why I go to, why did we do the lawsuit? It's full circle. I did the lawsuit to make sure that black people who represent these kids having this experience are able to advocate for them even more because of the conditions that they've been subject to, to no fault of their own. Mm. Now, Sherry, what happened to all of the lottery money? Or is that just smoke <laughs> and mirrors that they, Girl, that they just put in front of us? That's, you know. a, that's smoke screen and mirrors. Less than 6% of the lottery money uh, go to school funding. Most people don't You say what? You Less say what? than 6%. I did. If you could go back and do a search on a on a uh, interview I did out of state some years ago, less than six percent of, uh, and I was shocked when I learned it. When we, when you're first elected in the legislature, you go through this program at Michigan State mm -hmm. on state finance and funding, just to understand the backbone of the state and how things are funded, how appropriations work um and the like and that's when a lot of people in the room were shocked that the year that that they were working to pass that legislation that had to be voted on for us to have a lottery uh and the argument that they made is that it will help with the funding of our schools but uh, a lot of the money if you really dig into the finances of the lottery they people are getting rich off the contracts you got contracts for the tickets, them little orange tickets. Somebody's printing those and making yes. money. The machines that the lotteries come through, somebody's making those machines and selling them and making money. The commercials and the billboards you see, somebody is selling that and making money. It's like the people perish for lack of knowledge. Black folks don't have access to a lot of that contracting and procurement because we don't even realize people are making money by selling things to our state, our community that we have voted for and we're not even paying attention. And most of the money is in that game, the procurement side of it. So okay. people are getting wealthy and very rich just based on the business of the lottery. But what's left over, only 6% of that, or it makes, it makes up 6% of the school A budget. It makes up 6% of the school aid budget. So it's very small. Yeah, it compared to what all, you know, the amount of money that we spend each year, each month, each week, each That's day. Why you should have kept the street lottery. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. But you know, they tell us and 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 we fought we fell for it. You know, like yeah. all of this money is going into the state lottery system. It will be put right back into your child's public education. And that that's, was just a yeah, lie. That's, that's not that's that's not the case. And again, um, I don't know at what point we will become wise enough and have leadership that is non-relenting. Uh, and be willing to fight for us to have true access um, and stop being used um, in the political process. I don't know at what point that will occur, but I, I hope, I pray to God um, that it happens soon. Now, how, how is the Detroit Public Schools doing with their finances? How, how are you guys? Well, I mean, we're doing, we're doing relatively decent. I mean, I would have to say um, the, the state and I say quotation marks, bailout was not a bailout. It was money that was owed to us. We could never get a real audit of what occurred under state control. Um, so the funding that was provided, um, I just say the old system, we're paying, we have a system that's kind of split where we're paying for the old system. 
okay. as well as operating the new system. Um, but for COVID, we would probably be, you know, up a creek in a disaster. But because we did receive a lot of the funding um, that was earmarked for um, urban communities in our school aid funding budget, we're able to now uh, build a number of new schools. Uh, wait, 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 no, no, wait, you, well, you talking too fast here. I got to slow you down for Flint. So you got ESSER funds. Yes. And with those ESSER funds, you are, Detroit is now building new schools. Mm -hmm. How many? Uh, I believe we have seven. Don't quote me. Oh, what well, is I don't, I don't, yeah. Well, there's more than one. Seven. That's enough for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, definitely more than, definitely more than one. It may be more than seven. I know that we have Davis Aerospace. We have Cody, which I went to today. We have um, uh, Malcolm X Academy. We have Pershing. Malcolm X Academy. Wow. Yes, we have we have Pershing. We have we have a number of schools that have been. And I'm, I'm basing this list off the list that I I I was visiting, uh, but I, yeah, I think it's a it's about seven or more from elementary all the way to high school. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Kudos yeah. to Detroit. Yeah. We need Definitely. to come and visit your <laughs> Detroit school. Well, I mean, it's the leadership. Yeah, the leadership has to. I mean, like, I think the, the meeting that we all went to in Benton Harbor was the Black agenda, the state of Black agenda. I think it, next year it has the capacity to grow even more. Absolutely. And there can be more sharing of information. Uh, sharing of strategies, um, sharing of processes. Um, I think that was a great opportunity to unite and learn mm -hmm. from each other. Um, and I think that is what we need to do going forward. Maybe take time to break um, those uh, workshops into making sure that those who are representing um elected in certain communities along with the grassroots community and kind of coming together and convening in a way that we can glean some ideas and strategies from each other. That that would be would be helpful um, to at least share those practices because many people that were at that conference um, for the first time really learned and understood even what the whole redistricting case was about. And I just think there's so many other things that we can talk about as well, our schools and education being a priority, and then come up with a common agenda on how we wish to um, work together to, you know, I came to Benton Harbor and, and fought for the schools. Um, we pushed back when they were trying to close the schools. I came to Flint um, with Judge Greg Mathis and, and some others and, and bringing water and resources when Flint was dealing with what it was dealing with, with the water crisis. I just think that black leadership across the state have to find a, a, a way to work together to push and fight for issues that adversely impact our community, even if it isn't where we live. Mm -hmm. I agree, I agree. And I can tell that you are very involved in your community and we need more public officials that just don't jump on boards, just don't run for office, just for the title. They right. need to be involved. They need to so I can know stop what they're myself doing. To sleep That's over. okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Like I said, I was following you all around Facebook today, and I seen you going from here to here to here. The so part I that I showed, the part yeah, that yeah. I showed, because there was a part that the board is the board. We don't have a, I don't get a paycheck for the board. I had to go to my real job today, too. Oh, well, geez. So you got your real job. You yes. over here with the kids and then you're doing this and then you got a lot going on. Kudos Baby, to I'm you. Tr I'm trying to tell you. I'm Kudos trying to, tell to you. you. So how, one, one last question before we wrap up. Now, um, former state representative, mm -hmm. how involved were you with your community? Um, it seems like the state rep, people in Flint, they're just getting involved in now, like trying to find out what does the state rep do? I think that should have already been figured out before we go to the polls, before we electing somebody yeah. before 2024. We should know what our state rep does. 
Yeah. What does a state rep do? What did you do? How involved did you pass laws? What? Yeah. What so here's do? the thing. Before I even went to the legislature, I, you know, I am and have been an activist for years on all things education. So while my biggest issue has always the epicenter of my leadership has always been education. Even for before getting to the legislature, I was an advocate fighting for that. Now I had the benefit of working for two very strong city council members in Detroit, as well as working with our late Congressman John Conyers okay. on a number of community issues. So I had a, a very well-rounded public service um, vision that was fostered by my relationship and work with, with these individuals, the late Councilman Clyde Cleveland and Alberta Tinsley Talabi, who's also a former state rep. So knowing the problem that you're focused on as an educator, I'm a former science teacher. Uh, I'm a first generation high school and college graduate. So having that desire to fight for fair access to education, because I'm also the product of a single home whose father was in prison. And so I understand that our reading or third grade reading scores are is like the 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 measurement by which prisons are are built mm -hmm. and if you don't get education right then we're we're increasing the pipeline to prison so right. that was my theory of change before getting there once i got there um my voice uh in fighting for issues on justice justice on education justice on auto insurance justice on criminal justice reform justice on access for black business you know just call me justice uh because that was my fight and in addition to that the black community don't care about how many laws you pass they care about when they call you are they able to get you to come and deal with the issues that are plaguing their community their senior building their lack of food their lights being out even though we don't deal with the lights they just want you to get them to the right person or persons that can help resolve their constituent matters and so i worked in city council as a person who dealt with constituent services so that was my job when i people would call and say my lights out my trash didn't get picked up uh whatever the case was so once i went to lansing i prided myself in that same model so okay. oftentimes my seniors they have my phone number residents have my phone number i have the same phone number for 30 plus years and so just about everybody has it um and they would call me you know about their issues and i made sure that my staff addressed their issues yes you you pass laws depending on what environment you're in a majority or not a majority i worked in a majority for a non-majority for six whole years so it was harder to pass legislation, but I'm thankful that I was able to work across the aisle and get legislation passed, especially criminal justice reform. Um, one bad night, uh, clean slate legislation, good moral character legislation. So I'm very proud of that, especially given the fact that I served in a minority. But your no one person job looks the same. Whatever your district needs are, if you have agencies and there are 21 plus departments in the state, whether it's MDHHS, like during COVID, everybody had a, a, a need for something through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So having that direct access, that was part of my office responsibilities. People who were dealing with unemployment, we had a direct access to, to unemployment or UIA or whatever it's called now. Uh, to be able to address the fact that they weren't getting their 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 pay in a timely manner or being accused of falsely submitting claims. Mm -hmm. um, every department you think of, insurance, department of, of uh, is it DISC, departments of insurance and financial services, if somebody's claim, whether it was health claim, auto claim, house claim, whatever claim it was, was not fairly addressed. So there are different departments that you might interface with depending on the needs of your constituents. And being able to leverage that authority to get answers for your constituents and solutions for your constituents is what the job is all about. I probably made my own work 
a lot more hectic by serving from that constituent model. But that's the only way that I believe that you should serve is the people that 90,000 to 100 residents, whatever percentage is calling your office asking for your help or you to intervene in a situation, that's what our responsibility is. Okay, and one last question from our Flint Public School Board Vice President, Mr. Michael Clack. Thank you for joining us. How involved were you with the Detroit School District as a state representative? Oh, very, very involved. Very involved. Let me tell you something. There was a time I was, let me, I was, I'm so glad iPhone worked the way it does. Uh, the, the, I was the first woman chair and I just saw something that go past with, uh, former rep Cynthia A. Johnson. I can't see it because I'm on my phone and the print is so small. Uh, but hey, girl, I know you out there. I saw your name go by. Uh, but I was the current chair, Tyrone Carter, who served as the vice chair when I was the chair, reached out and asked me the other day about our logo. And I said, oh, let me find it. And so I went to my iPhone photos and put in Detroit Caucus. And when I put in Detroit Caucus, I was looking at so many old press releases and information that I had screenshot or saved because I, I probably have like 80,000 pictures in my phone. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot. So I was coming across some old press releases that I had saved because I, you know, I use social media a lot. And I actually saw one that said that we uncovered that they were about to charterize a number of a number of our districts. They don't know how we got the information to this day. Uh, but me and the chair before me uh, worked together to thwart their plan by putting it in the public space. Uh, so while we don't, we didn't have necessarily have authority over the district because the uh, our legislature controls the school aid budget, mm -hmm. they did respond to us and ultimately knew that they should answer us. Okay. Um, uh, and then again, the legislation that we voted on was for the schools. So that level of engagement, if the schools asked me to come out to speak, of course, like I still do now, mm -hmm. um, I went out to speak. But on a legislative level, we were passing laws. Um, you can go back and pull, you can go to YouTube and pull some of my old floor speeches where I railed on the A through F voting uh, measures that were there, the third grade reading measures that were there, the school aid budget. Um, I'm thankful that that I, I expressed myself uh, in that manner and that many of those speeches are on YouTube so people can find them uh, and hear actually the things that I was fighting for uh, during my tenure in the legislature. Right. Well, I thank you so much. Time This time is just flew by. Yeah, but I thank you, yeah, thank you so much for now, taking somebody time. Somebody's going to have to write me a pass for <laughs> Commissioner Monique Baker McCormick. I was supposed to go to her event. That's why you and I were supposed to start earlier. Uh -huh. But as God would have it, I have no control over my body needing rest. Right. And sometimes I realize I push it too far to the limit and I was exhausted. Um, before I fell asleep, a school called me and asked could they share some of the issues they were experiencing. I was like, listen, I would love to listen to you, but I'm exhausted. I got to take a quick nap before I go on a podcast. But but I, I needed that extra rest. And so um, the body will let you know. The and body, you the body will let you and it <laughs> let me know. And now I got to get redressed to go down to a meeting downtown <sighs> well. in 23 minutes. Well, have you just a small glass of champagne, just a small glass while you're there so you can relax. But thank you so much for gracing 810 News Media Group and the Winter Saw Show. I really appreciate with you. I hope this is not your first time on here. Would love to have you back. And uh, I'm going to let you close out. I'm looking forward to it. I'm very grateful that Student Minister Trey Muhammad uh, made sure that we were connected in that room. Uh, it was a blessing to connect with you in Benton Harbor. Yes. Um, I say that the Black agenda is is ever evolving and getting stronger. The fact that we can be on a podcast with technology from Detroit to Flint uh, and be able to compare our struggle uh, and talk about ways that we can champion our victory 
um, is give me a measure of hope and optimism. Um, it The work isn't always easy, but it's certainly worth it. Uh, and I'm thankful to have built that opportunity in sisterhood uh, with you. I look forward to coming back in the future, but more than that, I look forward to working behind the scenes, off the camera, to make sure that we get some strategies in place to truly Absolutely. ensure that Black uh, Michigan is thriving. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you have a wonderful evening and make thank sure you. you get you some, some rest tonight. That, that, <laughs> thank me. you. All. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> all right. And thank everyone out there. We will be back at the bump tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So see you all tomorrow morning. All thank right. you again. Bye-bye.